Hey, Nicholas with the Backyard Tart is here with another Random Thoughts podcast. Uh, this one, I think we got a, a little bit of a special one in store. I've been trying to get caught up on all my Red 5 Network roundups so that we are actually caught up to the month we're on. Uh, but as I was preparing for August and September, getting all the notes together, I realized I had way too much material. And I realized that... Uh, what I've been doing is at the end of the show, a show that I talk about a lot, like uh, uh, that a lot of the Red 5 Network are covering stuff such as like uh, Book of Boba Fett, Kenobi, Thor Love and Thunder, like all these different movies and different stuff I've been covering at the end. And I've been doing that pretty much all year this year. And that's worked out really well. But I think I'm not going to have time because I don't want to have a two-hour podcast um, mostly because I don't want to have to try to upload a two hour podcast. I have a hard enough time with 45 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to take those subjects. So what do we have? Well, I'm going to give my thoughts on the Mario movie and my predictions for it. Uh, Sonic Frontiers, that game is looking really good, but there's some interesting things coming out of Japan about that game. The Doctor Who 60th. I did a reaction to that, as you might have seen. Um, that is something, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan, I mean, it's the backyard TARDIS, so what are my expectations? What am I feeling about this? Picard Season 3, I did a reaction to that, hopefully that's out also by the time this comes out. Um, the first half of Andor has been completed, so definitely want to talk about that. She-Hulk, and, um, I think I'm gonna, I haven't finished Cobra Kai, so I think I'm gonna hold Cobra Kai off to another one of these. But uh, we'll do that, and so we're going to go through this, but uh, definitely want to say I'm loving Cobra Kai, so uh, that, that's another good one. If you're looking for a recommendation of these different shows I'm talking about to watch, I would say go watch that one. Okay, let's start right off the bat with a Mario movie. Um, first off, that trailer was amazing, and uh, I am a fan of animation. Um, some might not be too impressed with it because it seems like CGI animation is all around us. Not only do we have DreamWorks and Pixar and um, I always forget the name of the, is it Blue Sky, whoever does the um, Ice Age movies. And then you have the, the Minion movies, uh, which is done by Illumination. And then you have um, the guys that do like Wreck-It Ralph and stuff, which is actually what this reminds me of. I wonder if they got some of that team to work on this. Um, but because it doesn't feel like an Illumination movie. And Illumination is almost up to that tier. They, they have good humor and they got good singing. And, and, and a typical Illumination movie is to get a huge famous people cast. So a lot of people are apprehensive that Illumination was doing this at first because, well... The Chris Pratt elephant in the room, you know, uh, they're just going to swap everybody out with famous actors uh, when these have such iconic voices. But I think it's going to turn out well. I'm, I'm still not sure about Chris Pratt. Is, uh, I have no problem with Chris Pratt. Put that there. I'm not one of those people trying to cancel him. I, I just don't know if he's Mario. Um, and it was funny listening to a lot of other people's reactions. How many people feel that Chris Pratt is on the the edge of being canceled and they say he hasn't said some anything but he sounds like that kind of guy that would say stuff um I've been hearing that from even some youtubers and different ones that that I enjoy and I gotta say I find that very disturbing that people are preemptively preparing themselves to cancel someone especially like when you when you look at a situation like chris pratt if chris pratt was nintendo is super picky so if chris pratt was on the verge of being questionable i don't think they would have hitched themselves and i don't think disney who has admittedly fought like you look at what they did to gino carano if Chris Pratt was the kind of guy that was going to say something to get that, like, I don't think you would see uh, that much invested in, in, into Chris Pratt. So, you know, it's okay to have your own opinion that people don't agree with 
especially if you're going to keep it to yourself. Like, I, I don't see why everybody's got to be upset about that. Not sponsored. But anyways, the, the image on there was just so much better. And here's the thing. Illumination does good work, but despite their name of Illumination, I think the thing that they lack on is lighting, particle effects, um, reflection, those kind of things. Like when the, and as a gamer, I kind of have a unique thing because gamers talk about this all the time. When the PS3 went to the PS4, the big thing they talked about was lighting and particle effects. Like everything wasn't getting more smoother. Like they'd already gotten to the point where everybody's face was smooth. You know, things when the PS3 came out with it, it can never get better looking than this. But what they showed when like they were like turning on particle effects on and off and turning lighting on and off in the videos to show you the difference. It's amazing how much that in your mind works. And now with the PS5, uh, it's all about reflection. And like they did the Spider-Man trailer uh, of the game and they showed like here, here it is on the PS4 and here on the PS5 you can see Spider-Man's reflection in the puddles. Like the lighting, like the way that they've worked with lighting. And even though when you're looking at it, you can't tell that that is why this looks so amazing to you. But it does, because it affects you subconsciously. It looks more real. It looks more detailed. And Pixar and DreamWorks in particular have been good about this. Pixar is at the top. Uh, Illumination... Um, has not the, the, their characters have felt a little bit more flat and you know what you're watching a movie like the minions that doesn't matter but what I think is that with this it's taken up a step a notch now I did think that Mario's character design looked a lot like fix it Felix and I think a lot of that has to do with Miyamoto I think he had to work uh, for, for Bowser to be in the Wreck-It Ralph uh, movies and I think he looked at that and thought which fix up Felix was basically based on the Mario from the Donkey Kong arcade game because that's what they were spoofing so I think he looked at that and said that's that's how Mario should look I want that look and I think that's what the team delivered um, I have no facts to back that up I just it is undeniable that there is a fix it Felix feel to that which is not illumination style like they do more pointed noises they do more like when you look at something like sing or despicable me or something they do not look like that he these characters clearly look like a Wreck-It Ralph character model every studio has like their own style like you can look at a picture of a Pixar character from a movie you never saw and there's something about it that tells you that's a Pixar character or that's a DreamWorks character. Like I, I can tell that a random character from Madagascar is DreamWorks and not um, Pixar. So it's just everybody's got their own style. This is definitely, and I can't even remember the studio because for whatever reason, it's like Disney's internal animation studio, I think, but it's now doing the 3D stuff. I don't know if it's got a different name. I should have looked that up. But so that aside, I want to talk about my predictions about the plot. So when you look at the cast, like a lot of people, when they initially announced it, they saw Spike and they thought this was one of the, the Kooplings, one of the Koopa kids, uh, Spike. Uh, no. They specifically show that this is um, from the old NES game uh, Wrecking Crew, which was basically uh, a thing where like Spike was somebody that Mario was, you know, somebody's wrecking it, somebody's building it type situation. Um, and the fact that Cranky Kong, who, you know, if you're a film theory fan and you're just kind of a Nintendo fan that likes these theories, or I'm mean, not film theory, a game theory fan, uh, you know, like the, the 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 belief is that that Jumpman was Mario's dad, and he fought Cranky Kong, and like Mario is the one that goes to the Mushroom Kingdom with Luigi, and uh, Donkey Kong is actually Donkey Kong Jr.'s son, so he's you know like Donkey Kong the third, and that's who you're playing as through the Donkey Kong Country games. And it's just kind of a, a unique idea 
that has been floated out there in the Mario world, well, I think they could play around with that. I think that we are going to get, I think the movie is going to open up to one of two things. It's either going to open up to the scene we saw of Bowser taking over. And then, you know, Princess Toad, still Princess Peach, well, I think they've already said it's going to be called Princess Peach, sending Toad off to get help. And then I think we're going to see Toad go into a portal into... A lot of people are thinking, oh, they're going to do Chris Pratt in the real world, and he's going to go through the portal, because they did. They showed that this is going to be Mario's first time entering into the Mushroom Kingdom. And Toad already knows his name, unless they're fancy cutting... Which the Sonic movie did that. They take dialogue that's not from that scene, and they put it in a scene. So it's possible that some of those lines don't exist there. But from what we've given... Toad knows who Mario is, but Mario doesn't know, didn't know about the Mushroom Kingdom yet. So, I think instead of live action, we're going to see New Donk City. Which, per Mario Odyssey, that is where Mario uh, had his adventures as on the Wrecking Crew. That is where uh, Donkey Kong was, and he climbed the tower. He escaped the zoo and climbed up the construction site that Mario was working on. And Mario had to save his girlfriend, Pauline, who the gorilla had grabbed and taken to the top and was throwing barrels down at him. That all happens in New Donk City. I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see Toad go through the portal and be like, whoa, New Donk City, humans, this, that. But they're going to be cartoon humans. They're not going to be live action. And I think we're going to see Mario taking on Donkey Kong as like a villain, like he's going to have Pauline, or maybe, I don't think he's going to have Peach, because Peach is going to be, I think Pauline is going to have a guest appearance, Mario is going to epically save her, and that's going to be what Toad's going to be like, this is the hero we need to stop Bowser, and then he's going to take him to the portal, he's going to go through the portal first, then Mario is going to follow him, and then come out, and we're going to have that scene where he's like, whoa, what is this place? Because he's gone through a sewer pipe. And, um, sorry about the fly. Apparently I've attracted. But that's, that is my concept of how the story's going to go. And I do think that we are then going to get a, because it's already been confirmed that they are going to be making a Donkey Kong movie. I haven't looked a whole lot into that to see if it's confirmed that it's with Illumination I know Nintendo has set up their own animation studio. However, I have a feeling... See, a lot of people think that Nintendo is going to be handling all the animation. I don't think so. I don't think they picked up a big enough studio to do that. I think they picked up the studio so that they could have control. So that they could work with companies like Illumination. And partner with them. But they would have control over character design... They would have control over basic, simple editing plot stuff. And then hire this other company to light, partly license it out and do a lot of the backbone work. And then take in a lot of the publishing cost and risk. But Nintendo would have their company that would assist so that they would be there to kind of hands-on be correcting or changing things they don't like, to keep companies like Illumination rolled in so that there's nothing that they feel embarrasses their brand. That's what I think, I imagine that this studio is going to be. They're just going to be Nintendo's way to keep a hand in the pot of creation. I don't really think that Nintendo on their own is going to start publishing a whole bunch of movies. I don't think they bought a big enough studio. I don't think they have enough experience for it. But we'll see. Uh, but there's going to be a Donkey Kong Country movie. I think that that will be like an after credit. Yes, I think we're going to play the Marvel game here. Uh, so many DCs doing it now. Um, so many different properties are doing these after credit scenes now. Yes, Marvel started it, but it's a standard thing now. So that's what I think this is going to be the origin we're going to go through, we're going to meet all these characters, but because we have characters from Mario's pre, 
uh, Mushroom Kingdom adventures. Pre in the sewers against the Koopalines. We've got people from the Wrecking Crew. We've got people from the old Donkey Kong Arcade. I think we're going to show that off. I think we're going to show that is going to be the world we're going to see Mario in when the movie starts. My thoughts. Okay. Moving on to the next one. Sonic Frontiers. Um, I have been very lukewarm about Sonic Frontiers. It definitely looks like it's going to be something unique, something new, something big and huge. But I've been afraid that it was way too much for Sonic Team to be trying to pull off. I just... If you're... One, Sonic Team has been in kind of a slump. And I have not... I've not liked some of the things they do. I, I'm... As much as I liked um, the Sonic Origins collection and some of the stuff went into that, there are some things, some decisions Sonic Team made that made me very upset with them over that. Um, we look at some of the last 3D Sonic games that they did. Not the greatest. So I wonder, though, how long has Sonic Frontiers actually been in development? Like, um, did... Now I can't even think of the name. <laughs> I'm not sponsored. Um, anyway, it'll come to me. <laughs> but uh, the Sonic Forces. Like, were they working on Sonic Frontiers when Sonic... Like, did they wrap that game up so that they could start working on this? I don't know. But I just... This is a lot. However... Sonic has traditionally not been that big in Japan, especially since the Dreamcast went out. Like, that just, like, killed all interest in Sonic. Um, now, when you look at that, uh, with, with Sonic not being big there, what's been interesting is to see the way the Japanese market, one, it has sold out. The pre-orders have sold out in Japan. Um, two, Sakurai, who has traditionally been accused by Sonic fans of not liking Sonic because he made him so basic in his moveset and so trolly in his moveset in Super Smash Brothers, um, when he was probably the most requested character. He had to do him. I think a lot of that is he was the first one to do it. Unfortunately, he has not gotten upgraded. He has not gotten the treatment of the special when these were paid DLC. It was before paid DLC was a thing, and so he's just kind of grandfathered into the game. Uh, they're not putting any more flash into him because they don't want to spend more money on something that now is just considered standard included in the game. I think that is sad, but it is what it is. Sakurai was impressed. He was praising this game up and down. Some of the videos that we've seen, this game was the early on marketing with IGN. That was just horrible. Bad press idea. Why, Sega? Why? Why would you do that? Um, even as nice as the IGN was towards it, their way of releasing it was really bad. And honestly, IGN is the company that, you know, constantly makes the statement, was Sonic ever good? You know, um, so why, why are they getting the exclusive? Why are... And the way they handled it, the way they rolled it out, and to some understanding, some of that was how Sega told them they had to. Uh, the, you know, they had to hold back certain footage, certain things due to NDA. And they, the way they released it out, though, got everybody upset. Um, this, this game looks promising. And a lot of people are upset that the, um, the, uh, special stages or the uh, cyber stages or whatever are just rehashed, short little things. But to me, those are supposed to be like the special stages. Those are supposed to be like the special things that you can do that are brief moments and cool. They are not supposed to be the main chunk of the gameplay. So therefore, complaining that they don't live up to being what you wanted because your whole idea of that this game hangs up. It's an open world game. It is not a cyberspace game. So that's just my, my thoughts that everything I'm seeing, this should be really good. However, 
I might have to buy a system for this because the Switch version, I'm, I'm hearing bad reports on it. Uh, that the Switch can't really handle this game. And I don't think my computer could probably do much better than the Switch. So um, it, if I get it and I really enjoy it but I'm frustrated with the Switch version, I might just have to get, finally have a reason to get a next-gen system. Okay, now let's go into the Doctor Who 60th. So we're getting over to our sci-fi nerd. I'm getting out of the gaming into the sci-fi. Um, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. The 50th, one of my favorite moments in all of Doctor Who, but I have not been a fan of Jodie Whittaker. As I mentioned in my trailer reaction, I really think that they are clickbaiting the uh, audience into, you know, the whole plot being about erasing the 13th Doctor. Like, that is what the Master is saying he's going to do. However, I think the idea of bringing back the Daleks, the Cybermen, and the Master all in one big epic thing sounds very epic. I know um, David Tennant is filming some stuff. Uh, I don't know if it's for the 60th or after the 60th, if he's just doing some David Tennant specials. But him and Catherine Tate have been filming. I think it would be great to see that. I would like to see other Doctors too. You know, previously we got 10, 11, and that. I mean, if we could get every... They're going to have a hard time getting Chris Eccleston, even though he has been back in Doctor Who. He hates the idea of crossovers. And he's been very vocal about that lately, which... That almost makes me wonder, is he being vocal about that to, to tell us, I refuse to be in the 60th? Although he's also saying he's been a huge Jody Stan, so uh, I could see him being there, uh, the Ninth Doctor. Uh, he could also be doing all that to throw us off. Like, look at Liam Neeson going, they're still making Star Wars? <laughs> you know, it could be to throw us all off. I am, honestly, as a Doctor Who fan... Hoping that this episode is good. One, I like the Master. I like this iteration of the Master. So I want, seeing as he was ruined by having one of his two appearances be about the Timeless Child, something that I detest greatly. Um, that, However, the power of the Doctor being erased, uh, all the titling and some of the stuff almost... Almost makes me think that we're going to... I thought we had won and done with the Flux. We'd finally brought an end to the whole Timeless Child storyline. But I could feel them bringing that back out. I don't want that. I, I want that to be done and erased. Um, I'm a firm believer in... As much as I don't like this era of the Doctor. And I want certain plot lines to be considered decanonized. To get retconned in future things. I don't want it to be retconned that Jody was the Doctor. Uh, not because I think it's super important that the Doctor was a woman, not that I have a problem with the, the Doctor was a woman, um, but simply because it's a slippery slope that I don't agree with. Because a lot of people didn't like Capaldi. Capaldi was my favorite Doctor. So, therefore, if they start campaigning that Capaldi is no longer canon, do we take him out? Uh, if the 60th and Russell T. Davis's new run doesn't go well, um, do they just go all of New Who is is over and we're starting back at this? Or do they turn around and start back at the first Doctor and go all of classic, all of New Who? Like now this is new New Who and all of that is a different timeline, a different a different canon. Um, I don't really... I like the fact that despite this being one of the most wonky, contradictory shows, that it's so timey-wimey. Hello? Are you still there? Okay. Uh, sorry about that, folks. We had a bit of a uh, some Taran uh, plot. They used an Archine temporal wave to try to overheat my camera. Uh, thankfully, I was able to do my... Uh, Sonic pick and able to reverse the polarity. Got it taken care of. Uh, on that note, the Centaurans are asking if anybody knows a good intergalactic AC repair guy, as I seem to have uh, taken out that on their ship. Anyways, what were we at at our thought? Oh, 
Um, hmm. Wait a second. Wasn't I drinking a Coke Zero can? Hmm. Must be a side effect of reversing the polarity. Anyways, still not sponsored. Okay, so I believe what we were uh, wibbly wobbling about was the fact that I don't like the idea of making a doctrine on canon because I think it's a slippery slope. The moment you start saying this doctor isn't canon, then we can get in this whole fight and everybody can be hounding a studio of what doctor to make non-canon. I feel the same way about the Star Wars sequels. Um, I don't like them. I prefer the EU. And in my own head canon, in a lot of ways, that is going to always be what happens in Star Wars after Return of the Jedi. However, um, the canon, uh, the idea that we could start decanonizing movies, most people weren't a fan of the prequels at the time. That seems to have turned around. I think that's more people grew up uh, loving them are now adults on the internet. But I think there is a vast majority of people who would like say hey Disney while you're at it just undo the prequels redo those refilm those uh, that gets dangerous that you know it's a slippery slope I don't want to do that with Doctor Who one of the unique things is that it's timey wimey messed up and there have been slight retcons uh, I have a problem with the timeless child it is a serious retcon and I am going to have one of these random thought podcasts it is going to be covering all of the Chibnall area, episode by episode, breakdown after the 60th. And I'm going to go into just why I have a problem with The Timeless Child. and But you're going to get the most fairest response, because I am somebody who went into The 13th Doctor really, really trying to like it really being open-minded about it and there were a lot of episodes i didn't like but there were episodes that was like okay i i can see a glimmer like if it gets better i could see me liking this episode on rewatch and that's a silly thing to say but that's how i felt a lot about matt smith i didn't like matt smith at first when matt smith left i bawled even when the companions uh rory and amy left i didn't like them when they left they were some of my favorites. And I went back and I rewatched that and I absolutely loved that first season. But it wasn't until the second season that I actually started enjoying Matt Smith. That first season, my initial run, I just thought they're just destroying Doctor Who. Like that was my mindset. So when I went into Jody, and, and I gotta admit, Peter Capaldi, my favorite doctor. Uh, his first season was rough first watch going back with all the knowledge of all the stuff all the plot that they were dropping going back and suddenly catching all the Easter eggs and different things they were dropping I really love his first season uh, so I kind of took the same approach with Jody I'm like I'm not liking this but I've been down this road before is there things that I can start? What can I appreciate? I don't want to just be another voice on the internet being negative. But the problem is, is we're coming down to the end of it. And I don't think I'm going to shed a tear for Jodie leaving. Now there is an idea that she's going to first revert back to other doctors and then slowly go back up to Jodie and then turn into the new doctor. Or that the new doctor is going to somehow, like... The, the idea that a lot of people have is that they couldn't get Peter Capaldi, so he's not coming, but that they got uh, David Tennant and Matt Smith, and so she's going to somehow revert back to David Tennant or Eccleston, one of those, and then slowly start going through, and like something is going to, and this is all going to be inside a contraption that the master is controlling, and is like somehow moving the doctor backwards, and then the doctor is going to get it to move back forward, but then instead of becoming Jody or becoming Capaldi, because Capaldi's not going to be available to do it somehow, that'll be Noctu. And so somehow they're going to erase both Jody and Peter Capaldi. Like all these theories that fans or supposed leaks that are coming out all have me concerned about what their further damage they're going to do to canon. Um, I mean, I, I totally expect, like, 
if we had a big Finnish audio drama that has like all 20 doctors when we're, you know, another 15, 20 years in the future or whatever, uh, the, the Jody's going to exist. Uh, the Judoon doctor, um, her attachment to Timeless Child and the way that she plays in the timeline, I am totally against that doctor. However, I don't mind her and her performance as the Doctor. In fact, I think had she been the 13th Doctor, that might have worked. Not really a knock against Jodie. She's more companion material. Um, but and I, and I do think that Jodie has a flavor, has a thing that had she maybe been exposed to more classic Doctor Who, more, you know, David Tennant, Matt Smith, you know, Eccles, understood the show more. Um, she could have had fun with it with better directing and certainly better writing. Um, she could have been an okay doctor. However, she's been very outspoken against the fans that don't like it. And that comes from a place of not knowing. And I like how, um, trying to remember, recently there was, a, there was a, a, an actress that was talking about, um, I think it was uh, the one that plays uh, Missy. And she was doing an interview and she talked about how amazing the fans are and how protective they are. And so she doesn't get upset when they get backlash because they're protective of the franchise and it's something to be protected. And she honestly felt that she just needed to let her performance um Put those fears to rest. And Jodie does not come from a sci-fi background. She doesn't have an interest in Doctor Who or sci-fi in general. And she's not used to sci-fi style fans. She's used to drama epic who can be fanatical in the moment. But usually once the show's over, it's over. Like people aren't going back and, and hounding, uh, you know, days of our lives character, you know, drama piece characters like they do sci-fi um you know people who were actors in the 60s are still going to conventions and having people line up to get their autographs that is something unique to sci-fi that you don't see in drama like you may have gotten millions of people to be able to vote on american idol or something like that or to watch some, but those people don't have the long-term dedication like sci-fi. So it's a unique property that sci-fi and fantasy hold in that way uh, that these other uh, other genres just don't. Even if they might have a bigger overall impact on the world at the time, they don't have a lasting impact. And um, having a respect for the fans in that way is very important. And I think Jodie was just kind of out of her element. And unfortunately, I do not feel that anybody helped her in that department. Nobody helped her understand. I mean, maybe David Tennant did a little bit because, you know, he's from that. But it just, it shows. And so uh, the 60th looks like they're spending a big budget. Um, if my local theaters were saying it was in theater, I'd probably go see it because I'd want to see it in the best possible way. I know everybody's like, don't give it any money. I'm cautiously optimistic about what's coming next. But Russell T. Davis had a lot of agenda in his things, but people weren't raw then. And I think when his agenda comes out in this, because I think also he's going to feel liberated. Chibnall has busted the doors wide open anything russell t davis does is going to be tamed by comparison so uh, i think he's not going to feel like he has to coffer himself uh which he didn't do that much like he introduced a lot of stuff in his original a lot of his things that uh today i'm sorry everybody would be crying woke and um I don't know some of the choices he's making for the I'm not I'm not totally on board um, but we'll we'll see we'll see uh, I am very interested in what the 60th is gonna bring I would not say I'm excited for it or hyped for it I'm just very interested morbidly interested 
And I really want to see where the franchise goes. I want it to continue on. I want Doctor Who to get back to being good. I want to be able to overlook this era and look at it and go, okay, this was kind of cool. This was kind of cool. Uh, the rest of it was all garbage. Uh, can we just take that and move on? Um, that's kind of my, my opinion. Speaking of taking garbage and moving on, Picard Season 3, watch that trailer. That trailer had me hyped. Lore and Moriarty. Like, talk about two characters to bring back, to, like, just pull me back in. Now, if they do them wrong, if they do them, like, Seven of Nine in the previous two seasons, and Picard, I'm out. I'm out easy. But the writer-showrunner of this season is somebody who worked on one of the better seasons of Enterprise and, and left Enterprise because he wasn't able to do as much as he wanted, which would have made that season even better. And he's someone who gets Star Trek. He understands these characters, and he's not been a fan of the previous two seasons. And so he's going to, he's, he's stated, you don't have to have watched the previous two seasons to watch this. So I'm, I'm interested to see what's what's going to come of this. I do not know who that woman is. He's that's got the thing. Like I racked my brain and racked my brain. I did a little bit of research, and everything I looked at didn't show it. I am sure that if we found out what actress plays it, that she's got to have had a role previously or something. I didn't. I didn't spend that much time. I just kind of looked like for, uh, you know the the a couple of those videos it's like the 31 things you missed in this trailer and no one said who she was but like she's got to be somebody right somebody already establishing like because they're making her like a wrath of Khan type character but if you want to talk about a character to bring back maury hardy like i am someone who totally loved those episodes and the concept of him and when you think of where the technology in the trek universe was when that happened and where it is now, like, we have the Doctor with the mobile emitter. We have the idea, um, even with the previous seasons of Picard, of a ship that has holograms throughout. So Moriarty not being able to be out in the world, like, that that's not a case anymore. So I could see somebody bringing him out. That was the promise. When they developed technology like the mobile emitter, he was going to be taken out of that box. That was the whole concept and idea. Um... Well, Lore, uh, I'm trying to remember how his story and I really got to go back and watch that, as I said in my reaction. But I am hyped. I am urging ones who are Trek fans who turned into Picard. You know, maybe they didn't like Discovery, but they thought, well, we're going to try Picard. And they were, within a couple episodes, like, just, I'm out, never watching the show again. Everything I've heard about the second season, I made it two-thirds of the way through the first season. Uh, Hugh died uh, gruesomely. Egypt died right before that, and Seven of Nine was calling Picard uh, a, a delusional old fool. Which to me, the fact that she was saying like Picard was still somehow believing in this horrible world that the Federation. The Star Trek that we all know and love, where like mankind has worked through their problems. They're not drug abusers. They're not. The, they're not all these things. They've got their lives together. Um, or they're that he's somehow wrong and delusional. Like that we've been we've been seeing the whole world of Star Trek through the eyes of delusional captains. And then, in fact, this is a really messed up world, and Seven of Nine lives in it. I don't like that take. I, I'm really hoping that they shift away from that, that they do Seven of Nine right, they do Picard right, they bring it back, they bring back these other characters. Um, yeah, Wesley Crusher's back. You know, if that's the hit we got to take for the show to be good in other directions, then we're going to take it. But now, if they mess this up, I'm I'm on the fence about Strange New Worlds. I have not watched Strange New Worlds because I'm just so burnt out on Star Trek right now. So, if they nail this season right, 
because I've heard good things about Strange New Worlds, I think I'll go watch Strange New Worlds. If this show gets me hyped and back into Star Trek Universe. But if not, then, yeah, I'm probably not. Um, like, there's a new season of Lower Decks I haven't watched. Like, I'd, I'd probably get into that and and Strange New Worlds if this, if this season pulls me back in. It's a big if. But I am allowing myself to get my hopes up. Spoilers. Okay, next up, let's talk about Andor. We had the first six episodes. I talked briefly about the first three. We'll retouch on that when we're talking about this, but like the next three. Uh, so the fourth episode came out. We find out it's going to be a heist episode. Thought the heist would be the next episode. But the f so the fourth episode was planning the heist. The fifth episode was the morning of the heist of them arguing and bickering for 40 minutes. And then the next sixth episode was, well, the first 20 minutes of it about was more of that arguing and bickering and setting up and prepping for the thing. And then the last 25 minutes was intense action and fun and interesting and dare I say cinematic because wow like that escape scene going the lights like that was beautiful would love to see that on the big screen that was amazing looking despite that season um or episode six I fell asleep twice watching this first I was watching it that night I fell asleep Within like the first ten, five, ten minutes. Oh, I think around eight minutes. I said, no, it's not. I, I, I got to do a better justice. So I turned it off. Did I go to bed? No, I watched Stargate. I watched an episode of Stargate season five that I'd seen at least 20 times before. And I thoroughly enjoyed it and wasn't sleepy at all. Yeah. Next morning. Tried to watch it. You know, got up, got shaved, all that. That had a little bit of time before I had to start my work day. Started watching it. Got another 8, 10 minutes in. And found myself falling asleep again. Again. So I went to work. Did a few jobs. Had a customer who was late. And so I sat there and I watched the rest of it on my phone. Yes, on my phone. The, the great... You know, spectacular, amazing cinematic part. I watched that on my phone. Don't worry, I went back. I rewatched it on the TV. But I could care less about anybody that died. Like, everybody's going on and on and on about how much these characters were brought back uh, to, to, you know, depth of their story. Like, that we've been getting all this extra content. So I've noticed a pattern. We get two and a half episodes of build-up, half an episode of action. We've had that twice now. Episode 3 and episode 6 were definitely the best episodes of the season. And I don't mind a slow build-up episode. But we're not getting a slow build-up episode. We're getting two and a half. That really, sh basically, I think, out of this season right now, two whole episodes should just be deleted. Condensed. Episode 1 and 2 should be condensed into one episode. Episodes 4 and 5 should be condensed into one episode. It, and everybody's like, oh, you know, you don't have the attention span of this. It's not Star Wars. And so I'm going to say something here that hopefully doesn't offend ones, because I'm going to be very blunt, and it is just my opinion but here it goes. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of finally mature, Star Wars is maturing. We're getting a mature Star Wars. You know, this is the Star Wars we've been wanting for a long time. Star Wars was always for all ages. Has there been some stuff that was very kiddy? Yes. But despite the, the father arrangement with like Mandalorian, I don't think Mandalorian is kitty stuff. 
you're getting guys with their heads chopped off, cut in half. You know, when Boba Fett went to town with a gaffy stick, the way the those uh, uh, dark troopers, like, and then Luke against them, like, just... This is not a campy, happy-go-dory world. There's there's a lot of violence going on. There's a lot of different things. Yes, it is centered around the loving relationship between Baby Yoda and Jin. Uh, or Din Djarin. Um, but I think a lot of that now is they saw how that relationship was shown in the Book of Boba Fett. In the episode where... Grogu and Boba Fett are reunited, everyone was kind of like, oh my goodness, their story is so campy and cheap and this and that. And yeah, it was kind of done very cheap, very campy, very thing. But all of Book of Boba Fett was that way. So that's, I don't hold that against the show Mandalorian. Because in Mandalorian, like that, that relationship, that's like, it's just so well done, but it's not like it's not a high stakes thing. And it's not any different than, you know, Luke hauling around two bumbling droids, you know, you know, they're always taking C-3PO into battle and he's like just this giant target that's bumbling and ha he's not really contributing much except for occasionally he gets to translate. Um, but they're hauling him around everywhere and it, and it brings a little, baby Yoda is that like he, that, that, that cuteness, that comedy, that's the levity that is Star Wars. If, you feel like this is finally Star Wars. If you feel this is the best thing that's come Star Wars since Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi um, or Revenge of the Sith, whatever. If you feel like Star Wars hasn't been this good in decades um, and you feel like all the stuff we got in Season 7 of Clone Wars, the end of Rebels, these different things, were just way too kiddy. If you feel that the Mandalorian was just way too kiddy, it wasn't what you wanted Star Wars, and that Star Wars needs to grow. If this is your thought, it's not that Star Wars suddenly became for kids. It's that you've grown out of Star Wars. Plain and simple. Star Wars isn't capturing your home. The OT, obviously it does because you have nostalgia for it, but you're just not that into Star Wars. If Star Wars came out today, the OT, and you had never seen it, it might not be your thing. You want something more mature, like Blade Runner. And that's fine. Blade Runner's great. Enjoy stuff like Blade Runner. But, there, but Star Wars doesn't need to grow up. Because Star Wars was for everyone. And there are some people who are cynical that just, no, it's too campy. It's one of the reasons why it's timeless. Because George didn't make it to the movies this day. You know, when you think of the 70s and 80s, like a lot of the sci-fi of that era, super dark, bleak. A lot of, you know, you compare it to stuff like Alien and Terminator and other stuff that came out shortly after it that are by the people, by people like Spielberg and all that, that were in uh, George Lucas's sphere of the changing hallway. What was George Lucas doing? He was looking at the serials. He was looking at the classic adventure. And yes, there is a little bit of a camp to it. There is a little bit of the good guys are good and they always win. And the bad guys are very evil and they're not misunderstood. They're just evil. That was very much a big part of what made Star Wars Star Wars. And yes, Nora the Vader had the original redemption. You know who didn't get redeemed? The Emperor. Tarkin, most of the, so there's a human element, and it's interesting to see the human element of the, like, the individual stormtroopers aren't necessarily evil, and the rebels aren't necessarily altruistic, uh, it is, I've always been a fan of, like, the idea that, you know, the rebels, they're actually, in a, in a lot of ways, like, when you stop and think about it, they're the bad guys, they're the bad guys because they're the ones being terrorists. They're just, yes, the Emperor is evil, but the Empire isn't. And it does some things that are evil. That very much feels like the U.S. to me. Like the U.S., like our government, like at the top, it, it's corrupt. It's, it's awful. And we go out and we, 
like I say we, I don't identify like that. Like, like I'm talking about like the, the government of the U.S. They go out and they do wars. They stick their fingers in stuff. They they change the policies of other countries and, and bend them to their will. That is what we're seeing the empire do. Yet everybody says the U.S. is a great and positive force. That was probably the view of a lot of people of the empire, especially people in the empire. Here's the rebels. They're terrorists. They're insurrections. They're liberators. They're blowing stuff up. Killing people. Like, but that's not why you go to watch Star Wars. You don't go to watch Star Wars. Like, it's a fun thing to joke about. And just like I think it's it's dumb to have the joke that stormtroopers can't shoot in Star Wars, I think it's also bad to make the real world musings of, well, you know, actually the Empire is in the right and the rebels are really the bad guys because they're blowing up innocent people. They're creating, the empire may be led by an evil guy, but he's creating order in the world. Okay, well, maybe they're, they're, they're fascists. Like, we've, we've, we've focused on a lot. Like, they're not good towards aliens. They're not good, you know, we have to do stuff to make them remind us that they're evil. But at the end of the day, from the general public's thing, they're the police. They're the officers. They're the ones protecting you. They're the army that protects you. And the rebels are people that don't want to be under the rule of that government. How is that any different today? But we don't want to view it that way. That's not the way Star Wars was presented to us. It is a heroic story. And so in that respects, Andor just kind of falls flat. It's boring. But it's, I mean, it's good. It's quality. But it's also, it's super slow paced. That's not Star Wars. And that's not that fast pace is kitty. On the contrary, there's a lot of rated R movies that kids aren't supposed to, that are fast paced. I don't think of uh, Escape from New York as a slow burn. Uh, and that's definitely an adult film. Um, so, like, this idea that you have to be uh, slow and drama and dramatized and get all that. Like, I don't need to see rent cop eating cereal. And, and question, is his name actually cereal? Because that's what everybody's calling him. But at first I thought that was just like the meme because he eats the, the blue Cocoa Puffs and the blue milk. I, we don't need that. Don't, don't want that. Um, so... Was episode six really enjoyable? Yeah, but was it worth it? Like, the fact that I had to go sit through those two episodes to get there made me really not care. I didn't really, I, instead of making me care about these characters, it made me not care about them. And if this is what we're wanting, like, I cannot wait to get to Mandalorian season three because I do not want this to be my Star Wars going forward. If it is the Star Wars going forward, I'm out. I'm just not going to watch Star Wars anymore. Like, that's just, this does not interest me. And it can be cinematic as all. And so, now, if all Star Wars was like Book of Boba Fett, I'd probably be out too. <laughs> Book of Boba Fett was a joke. However, I will say this, and the show hasn't ended, but we had those two episodes of the Book of Boba Fett where we were following Mandalorian and the one where we were with Luke. Those have me super hyped. And when we had the episode where Boba Fett was taking on the train with the Tuscans, I really enjoyed that. Like, those were hype moments. I was more hyped for those, despite their less quality and despite all the bad episodes around them, than I am for Andor. And admittedly, episode six, that was spectacular. The, the, the visual effects we saw for that escape outdid anything we saw in Book of Boba Fett. Probably maybe even anything we saw in Mandalorian um, and Kenobi. But I'm going to say it right now. If I were to grade on the first six episodes, I would rake Andor. This is going to be the, this is going to be the, 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 the hot take that is going to bar me access from ever joining the Red 5 Network. I'm trying to get my quality up to the point where I can join the Red 5 Network. And this this is the take that Roe is going to go, no, 
No, you cannot. You have that take. You cannot be in there. But I am going to rank, based on just the first six episodes, that the Book of Boba Fett is better than Andor. That's my hot take. Burn it down. Unsubscribe. Dislike button. Hit it. Actually, go ahead. Hit the dislike button if, if you really are upset by that because it'll let me know. Um, I, I'm not upset by somebody hitting the dislike button. So if, if you want to go ahead and let me know, I want to see that in my analytics that I got a bunch of dislike buttons. Uh, but I am not saying that, like, obviously Andor is less offensive. It, it, it does not in any way upset my Star Wars nerddom. But it also doesn't really move the needle of enjoyment at all. And there are select episodes of Book of Boba Fett that I've rewatched when I rewatched The Mandalorian. And um, I have a friend that, you know, I'm trying to get him back into watching Star Wars. He he had lit his Disney Plus subscription lapse, and so he's getting, he resubscribed. I am really interested in what he thinks about Book of Boba Fett. I want him to see specifically certain episodes that I want to talk to him about Book of Boba Fett. I have no interest in talking to him about Andor. It's boring. And everybody's talking and gushing about Andor, and I'm finding a lot of that boring too. Like, I'm trying to be engaged, and I'm glad everybody's loving it, compared to everybody ragging on a show every week. But I'm just not... It's just plain toast to me you know especially for a show that is about you know cultural and having a latino as the lead role and all this stuff that everybody's been pumping up this is white bread for me that is what andor is is white bread it is milk toast it is just plain plain and boring and ordinary nothing that stands out and I don't need Star Wars to be all lightsabers and action and stuff like that but I need to have characters I care about and story that I care about and honestly constantly throwing new characters at me giving me a whole bunch of backstory and then it going nowhere oh uh, yeah we're we're gonna tell you like a bunch of random details about why this person is the fight to kill him off next episode like and the one character I feel like I'm getting no knowledge of is Andor. And he's who the show's about. Okay. With that, we're going into the last one here. And that is She-Hulk. <laughs> this one. This one is going to, uh, you know, there is going to be some spoilers here. Uh, so if you haven't watched She-Hulk, but this is... Uh, I am somebody who, I didn't read the 80s run, I wikipedia to get knowledge of that, but the 90s run that started in like 89 of She-Hulk, I uniquely had read that. I don't, I haven't read a lot of Marvel. You know, in fact, my Marvel content mostly consists of Spider-Man, Iron Man, a little Fantastic Four, Miss Marvel, uh, back when Miss Marvel was Cara Danvers. Um... And she wasn't the fighter pilot, whatever, but was, you know, like a lab assistant to Marvel. Um, and the other one was um, She Hulk. I liked She Hulk. Um, why did I like She Hulk? It was just, well, I'm not going to lie. It was a lady, a good looking lady in green call it the sci-fi guy in me but you know since star trek the green girl like come on that's gonna get a young guy to pick that up but i just liked the sassiness the snarkiness of it and it you know it is about like the inside of the female psyche because she breaks the fourth wall and kind of tells you what women are thinking type thing to the situation i found that interesting now how much of that was actually accurate and how much of it was a me just like telling myself that this is how women think and being like just a total dumb teenage boy uh yeah so uh but when the first couple of episodes came out people were angry at the, but the people were angry at this from the trailers all the cg honestly 
I don't know what they were expecting because the CG felt on par with what I thought it would be. Uh, did it look like a Disney movie? like Avengers movie level? No, but this is TV. Uh, did it look better than the CW? Quite a bit. So in my opinion, it's actually pretty good CG for a television show. Um, this is not Game of Thrones. This is not like everybody's putting it on some standard that it's not, and they're judging it by that. I thought it looked fine. Um, the first couple of episodes, like people were just outraged, and I'm going, hey, this is what the comic is. And I had heard for quite some time people going, stop turning male characters. Bring back like strong female characters from the comic. Bring us She-Hulk. Bring us Storm. Bring us Jean Grey. Bring us, you know, uh, this is fantastic. The Invisible Woman. Like, bring us out these characters. Well, here we have one of those characters that people would list off. Bring us this character. And you know who else? Miss Marvel. They brought they brought Miss Marvel. They gave her a movie. And uh, or Captain Marvel, and people hated it, and I get why people hate it, and I uh, partially agree with it, though I don't think that movie is as bad as everybody makes it out to be. Uh, I dislike it more for the cannon breaking stuff than her, you know, having a problem with a guy uh, being rude to her about a motorcycle and stealing his motorcycle. Superman, the same people who complain about that, like a movie where Superman stacks a bunch of cars on top of each other because some people said some nasty things to him in a bar. So her stealing a biker's uh, motorcycle to get around when she's on a mission, to me, I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with some of the cannon breaking, the stuff about... Uh, his, his eye and uh, like certain stuff in the canon not lining up. The idea that through all the invasions that Earth faced against Ultron and all that, that he never clicked the button to call Captain Marvel till, till Thanos snap. Uh, yeah, I don't buy that at all. He would have been there from the first moment they needed the Avengers. He would have called her. So, I didn't like how that that retroactively set on canon. But other than that, and I didn't like the order and the pacing and the flashback, like the way the movie was done, I thought was bad. But the movie looked good to me. I liked the special effects in it. And overall, I generally like the character. Um, I don't like it with how the actor talks when she talks to the fans. I totally get that. But I separate um, art from the artist. And doing that, um, I don't really, I don't take any of that baggage into me into the movie. Um, could she have smiled more? Yeah, maybe that was direction. No, oh, She-Hulk. She's definitely smiling, but people have a problem with it. She's having fun, and people have a problem with that. She goes on some bad dates. Have you watched a sitcom? Like, what sitcom? Friends, Seinfeld, um, you know, any of these type of things, Big Bang Theory, any of them. Like, they go on a blind date, and it's bad. It's always bad. This is like the joke. This is what a sitcom... But it's played up for laughs in the Marvel court. Her court cases. I was like, that's ridiculous. That's never how a court case would happen. Okay, I'm sorry, but have you watched, like, Capcom's Phoenix Wright? Like, type stuff? Like, part of the whole thing here is that it's supposed to be funny. It is supposed to be something that um, is ridiculous. Here's the turn. It went from that, and then the showrunner started being writer on episodes. And she's the fourth generation feminist, activist, whatever. And she took those points that were funny jokes. Like, we know we're going into a show that is about the feminist perspective and all that. And these are some funny jokes. What is she taking it to? She's taking it way too far. It's going now into a point where it's like it's just like beating a dead horse um men bad women good women's life sucks because men are bad wouldn't we all be better without them type attitude and i'm i'm, I'm sorry it's it just you know the whole idea of her having to bring all her bad boyfriend dates before uh dates to testify of how into she hulk she is was a bit much but i could have overlooked it but then the next episode, first of all, She-Hulk looks at the camera and tells you it's going to be a bad episode because it's a wedding episode and wedding episodes suck, but weddings suck in real life, so deal with it. Um, announcing that this episode is going to be bad and say deal with it, but the wedding part of the episode wasn't the bad part. 
the bad part was everything going on with her coworkers. Well, they get this client who is immortal. So when he dies, he, he instantly like heals back in a few minutes. And he is so against conflict that when he loses interest in a wife or husband, he uh, just offs himself, gets a death certificate, and then goes back to living under a new identity. And because uh, he doesn't like the conflict of divorce. And his ex-wives and husband have found this out and they are suing him. And so they're representing him and his lawyers are laughing at him. And they're, they're basically, no, 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 you're a piece of junk. You're going to pay out the nose. Uh, be thankful. We're going to keep you out of prison. Blah, blah, blah. You're horrible. This, that. Uh, and the guy jumps out of the window because he doesn't like dealing with him. His, his own lawyers. Uh, and then, you know, snaps his neck back into place and waves and goes on. The, the concept of this is just horrible. And then the idea that this paralegal aid of, of She-Hulk's comes up with the brilliant plan of like, okay, you're going to pay her money, but her you're going to give her five minutes of a deep stare in the eyes. And you're going to, you're going to do this for this person and this, uh, give this person their this back. I'm sorry. If someone's getting thousands of dollars, Everybody at that table is going to demand. Nobody is going to be happy with just getting a long, lustful stare in the eyes into the soul. No. Nobody is going to be cool with that. Uh, everybody is going to want a piece of money. Um, lawyers represent the scum of the earth. Crime bosses, murderers, all that thing. Because they believe that everybody deserves right to that. If you're representing someone, you are not actively mocking them. Like, if you can't do your job and do that, you pass on the case. You say, I'm sorry, I have a conflict of interest. I'm a woman, I just can't represent you. You're just a piece of garbage. That I can believe. But the idea, we're taking the case, but we're going to mock you the whole time, even though you're paying us our paycheck. That, to me, was just too, too much. Then, okay, next episode, we have a, she goes to Tim Blanke, maybe he was out of his thing, all that, and he has the retreat. This was funny. This was kind of enjoyable. I have a friend who has a facility very similar to that, uh, and I like going up there and being in the sauna and then jumping in the ice cold lake and stuff like that. So uh, I enjoyed that episode. It was kind of that next episode, we get Daredevil, Daredevil. Um, I love how Daredevil comes in and he's just whipping her butt as a lawyer. That is great. The Daredevil's like, he's just mopping the floor with her. He comes in, he gives her excellent advice. And this Daredevil, he's smiling a little bit more. He's just, well, he's in the Shiri Hulk universe. I have no problem with that. That is like when, um, Deadpool is in Spider-Man. He PGs himself down to Spider-Man's level. That doesn't make him less Deadpool. It doesn't mean that Deadpool himself changes. That's just how he works when he's in. Because Spider-Man's the lead. She-Hulk is the lead here. Daredevil is the guest star. He is going to be a little sitcom-y. A little bit in the She-Hulk realm. He's not going to be as gruff and serious in that. If Daredevil crossed over with a character like Batman. He would be dark and gritty. But no, he's in She-Hulk. And so he's going to be a little bit more of a lighter take on Daredevil. He's adapting to his environment. No problem with that. But the idea of him holding his boots while he's in costume in the light of day doing the walk of shame in a suburb. No. No. Don't do that to Daredevil. Don't. That's just, that's just wrong. That is dirty. Like... He is a stealthy ninja. He doesn't gently walk around. Like, he would change out into his regular uh, clothes and and go off. Or he would be in full geared up Daredevil, sneaking through the shadows. Nobody would know he was there type thing. He would not be just walking down the street. Um, Daredevil, walk of shame. No. No. I, I did not like that. 
last episode. Okay, the last episode just seemed like, man, this is going badly, this is going badly. And then She-Hulk's like, enough is enough. This is crazy, this is bad. Pools, they did this in Death Paddle when they did Deadpool versus Pinkie Pie. Like, goes out into the search, the, the, the search bar and finds like one of the Disney Plus like behind the scenes things, jumps into that, goes to the head Marvel office, you know, bursts into the writer's room, and they display the writers as being complete idiots. Uh, yeah. Wouldn't it be cool? Oh, we got sticky notes and oh Kevin likes this. We're gonna do this because Kevin likes it. And oh, don't you think this is like uh but Kevin wouldn't like that. Oh, we only do what Kevin does like They're making fun of themselves, blah, blah, blah. And then she's like, I'm going to get Kevin. And he's like, uh, we love you, She-Hulk, but we would die to protect Kevin. And then they do nothing. What? And she's going through, and she's like going through the marble, and she's like just beating up the guards. And there was a thing where she had to sign an NDA, and then they didn't give her access. And they're like, why did you make me sign the NDA if you weren't going to let me in? And he's like, everybody has to sign the NDA. <laughs> that is such a Marvel thing. That was just such a Hollywood thing, but a big Marvel thing. They always have problems with NDAs uh, and these actors. But um, they get in, and instead of Kevin Feige, it's like this round room of like the intro to the Marvel Cinematic Universe and just images of the movies. And there's like this ball droid that just looks like GLaDOS. And kind of has a GLaDOS type, male version of GLaDOS type voice. And it is the Kevin, the K. V I N uh Kevin uh K -E yeah don't ask me to spell on the spot um but anyways it's going around it's a it's an AI algorithm that bases it this is everything that everybody accuses Marvel of being they accuse them of being cookie cutter working to the algorithm just doing what they do and he's going around and right and, and she hulks like no 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 this and he's like wait wouldn't that make it lame? <laughs> like, no, we this that. And it's funny because she does end up making the ending kind of lamer. <laughs> like, it was crazy. It was bad writing. It was all this. But it was going to be like this really intense action scene. She, like, took it all the way. I like um, what uh, one of the uh, – Danny from Comics and Cosmetics, you know, did a tweet that said, you know, uh, women like action and stuff too. Like, you know, don't don't make it look like this is what women want comic book movies to be about. And, you know, so it was just, but, you know, and then she's like, no, no, um, there's no reason from there, but put Daredevil in there because, you know, woman has needs. <laughs> just like, I thought these lines were funny, but like they were just like deconstructing him. And then he was like, get out and he's like see you in the movies or something like that and she's like really and he's like no get out <laughs> it's like the whole interaction we get like that had me laughing in it and I, it was brilliant but it took me a long time i was thinking about it and ultimately that means that to make that joke land as part of the plan they had to make the whole show have bad writing which it kind of did so was that intentional is that good? Is having a whole show be just a gaslighting experiment? A troll? Like, this is taking, like, the concept of a clickbait YouTube channel. Like, when you like something, but you label the, the video as the worst ever blank, that's, that's essentially what this was. They, the, whole, the whole season was about getting YouTubers upset about getting the fans upset. It was about all these different things. And then it comes back around to this. It, it just kind of, it's like the purpose of the show was to upset fans and to go, just kidding. It was all a prank. We really don't feel that way about you. Or do we? How do you want to take this? It seems like a big screw you to the fans in a, in a way. It, it seems like, you know, we hear all your complaints. We know exactly what you say about us. And you know what? We're going to be true to ourselves, and we don't care. There's something respectable about that, but there's also, like, that's not how you treat fans. And to spend this much money to piss this many people off, like, it just, it's not what She-Hulk deserved. 
Like, those first couple of episodes, they were upsetting people. But She-Hulk deserved, like, the funny, rom com court drama battle thing. Like, it needed to be fun, it needed to be wacky, it needed, and it wasn't going to be for everyone. But it deserved to be a complete She-Hulk story, not this whole turnaround of events. Like, I was waiting for the leader. Elegencia is a program led by the leader was mortal enemy of the hulks i was waiting for the end when it was finally going to be revealed and we were going to bring the leader into in the mcu canon and then they like just dropped the ball on that um that's a bait and switch i hate bait and switches like that like i did not like the way they did the mandarin in iron man 3 uh you know this that that kind of stuff i don't like so Ultimately, I didn't like She-Hulk. I'm a huge She-Hulk fan. Like, you need to get, in addition to the women that are going to be on board that you're you're targeting, you need to get a certain amount of the male audience. You can't alienate them all. I feel like I was a fan of the 90s She-Hulk comic that this is being based on. I was a fan of, like, the, the feminine flair and touch and all that. And it... It kicked me off the show. If it kicked me off the show, and most of the people who are people who like most of the MCU that are in my circle of friends aren't really caring for this. A lot of the people in the Red Fine Network stopped watching it. And these are people who like The Last Jedi. These are people who liked Shang-Chi. They liked Eternals. They like these are people who um liked uh the recent um these are people that like Ring of Power. These are pe- So these are people from all over the spectrum that I know that I'm friends with because I'm friends with everyone. Anybody who's willing to be cool and talk and not be upset that people have opinions, I'm friends with online. I, I love to talk nerd stuff. So a lot of them said, yeah, we need an episode or two in, and we just dropped off, didn't care for it. This show had to do horribly in numbers. And the people who were watching, I think, were more hate-watching. There are people who are liking it, but I think they're liking it just because they want to push an agenda. That's the same thing with the current era of Doctor Who. You have people who are not Doctor Who fans that have become Jodie Whittaker, Chibnall era Doctor Who fans simply because they like the message that it's projecting, but they have no care of anything that came before it. And I'm okay with somebody liking that era, but I'm not okay with with people who only like it in word because of a, a messaging. That, that should not be the only reason why you like a portion of the property and none of the rest of the property. Like, oh, Doctor Who was a toxic property until this. Or, or Marvel was a toxic property until this. Like, that should not be a thing. Um, so I think... Ultimately, I think She-Hulk was a big fail. I hope they course correct with the second season because they've already confirmed that there's another season. So, uh, but that's that's my takes. Uh, I've had a lot of hot takes in this one. Um, we're gonna save Cobra Kai for when I finish it. Maybe in uh, uh, I'll do one of these in another month or two because I'll have too many things to talk in it. But uh, with that, hope everybody's having a good day. Hope I didn't cause you to unsubscribe. I'll catch you. You can tell me down in the comments below how wrong or right I am. And I look forward to reading it. Have a good day.